Okay, good evening everyone, or good afternoon in this case as I'm recording. So tonight we're going to talk about astrophotography and, you know, the first uh, steps in taking pictures of the skies. Um, and of course I'm going to ask you again questions and don't forget to ask questions in turn in the Facebook chat. Good evening everyone. Tonight I'm going to talk about the history of astrophotography. And in particular, I'm going to con concentrate on the first, say, 100 years of, you know, photography of the heavens. And occasionally, I'm going to jump ahead to more recent times just to show you some very spectacular images. The one you see here, actually, is uh, one of the re most recent pictures that come from the nice website that is called Astronomy Picture of the Day. And so today, if you just want to go up and look for nice pictures of the skies, just use this website and you will have the best of the day. Here you, what you see is a cosmic triangle where you can see both the Moon, the Pleiades and Venus. Now, the first picture ever taken was the view from the window of Nicephor Nips, who invented the so-called heliograph. This basically consisted of a camera obscura, which is a wooden box like the one shown here, with at its back a plate coated with bitumen of Judea, which is a sort of natural asphalt that hardens when exposed to light. These kind of pictures took ages to obtain, several hours at times. If you think that the previous image was quite bad, then take a look at the very first ever digital picture, in this case showing the little son of one of the pioneers of digital photography, Russell Kirsch. As you can see, it's quite coarse, in fact it consisted only of 176 times 176 pixels. Going back to the 19th century, here is another early picture by the inventor of the so-called daguerreotype, Louis Daguerre, who developed a faster system for capturing images on a silver-coated plate. This image shows a street in Paris, but it also is the first surviving picture of a human. Now, Morgana, can you spot the him or her? Can you see the human, the person in this picture? Where is it? Oh, no? Well, I'll show you what it is. It's down here. So that actually was a person that was having his shoes polished. And the image was actually able to capture it because perhaps that person was standing in that exact position for, say, 10 minutes, which is the exposure time that these uh, pictures took. Now, speaking about humans, this is the first ever selfie which was taken by the American photographer Robert Cornelius and in fact it's the first picture of an American ever. Fast forward in time, here's another American, Buzz Aldrin, who took the first selfie in space in 1966. Now my next question to you is, in which mission, on what mission was this taken? Was it Gemini, Mercury, Apollo or Enterprise? Apollo. No, my guy was on the Gemini mission, which was a precursor of the Apollo mission and which followed the very first Mercury program. Now let's go back to the daguerreotype. An interesting story about the daguerreotype is that this was invented by Louis Daguerre in collaboration with the son of the previous person, Mr. Fro Nibs. And uh, essentially this, in the end, was distributed freely with instruction and everything to the world. So photography was basically made available for humanity, with no license required to use it, except in the UK and its colonies for a long history that I'm not going to explain, but you can actually look up. And we actually can look up. Yes, we can look it up. Now, now taking this picture actually took a long time. People had to hold still for several minutes. Yeah. So how could they do that? You know, we are talking about 20, 30 minutes to take a picture, which was really a boring <laughs> process. Well, there were tricks. They were actually standing on some special stands that you can see here. Now, let's go back to the topic of this uh, talk, which is astrophotography. We've seen a picture from space. Now let's look at the first picture of the moon. Now, this was taken by John Draper in 1840 with a daguerreotype, which was the device that we discussed before. Now, 
it wasn't a great picture and it got quite disturbed uh, by the gradient of time. Uh, the best picture that actually we have was by John Whipple some 12 years later. Uh, to take this picture or any picture that you have uh, of objects in the in the sky you actually have to compensate for the rotation of the earth in other words you have to be able to follow these objects with your telescope quite accurately so they stay at the center of your eyepiece where you have where you put your photographic plate to do this to do this you need a telescope that is actually mounted on a so-called equatorial mount such as the one with which this picture was taken, which was the Harvard Great Refractor. And the trick is to have your telescope mounted on two axes. One that points directly to the uh, northern star uh, and that allows you to rotate the whole structure uh, basically uh, along the same axis uh, around which the Earth spins. So that is the axis that allows you to compensate for the rotation of the earth in fact in Amma we have one of the first telescope of this kind uh, that admittedly was a bit too ahead of his time so it was not used that much but still is one of the first equatorial mounted telescopes and it is also remarkably the oldest of such telescopes that is still in his original location so if you come to Amma at the observatory you can actually still see how this telescope uh, was installed with all the dome inside the observatory itself and all the instruments around it. Now, talking about the moon, let's fast forward again and let's look at this picture. This was the first picture of the far side of the moon and my question to you is that this was taken by whom, Morgana? Was it taken by the Americans or the Russians? The Russians. The Russians, you're right. And this indeed was taken in 1959 by the so-called Luna 3 mission. Another object that you will obviously think of taking picture of, although you have to be quite careful because it's very bright and you will uh, overexpose and burn out your, uh, your camera, is the sun. And what people did particular was to take a, a spectrum of the sun which essentially is uh, what you get when you take the light of the sun you run it through a prism and you split it in this kind of rainbow which tells you a bit more of uh, the nature of the light emitted by the sun and in particular in which color the sun emits more you can more easily take pictures of the sun during a solar eclipse but when most of the light from the sun is obscured by the moon in this case, this brings out the light that comes from the upper layer of the sun or the so-called photosphere and corona. So the um, so-called, you can think of this as the atmosphere of the sun. And by doing this, Berkowski discovered during the solar eclipse of 1851 um, that the sun actually has solar eruptions, what we now call solar flares. If you take a spectrum of the sunlight that comes from the atmosphere of the sun during such solar eclipse you actually can find now very significant lines here on the spectrum uh, this is a spectrum actually was taken in uh, during the big solar American eclipse of 2017 and these lines tells you about the elements the that actually are present in this uh, in the atmosphere of the sun so my question to you Morgana is which element was actually discovered by Johnson in 1868 was it called hydrogen helium or uranium what uranium no it was actually the helium which helium actually means sun and it comes from Helios in Greek and the lines of the helium are indeed this one, the yellow one, big bright yellow one here that you can see, and this little red one here. Now, from the sun, let's move to planets. Here are the first pictures of Jupiter and Saturn, taken in 1885. Interestingly, 
when you look at all pictures of Jupiter, you recognize also the very noticeable giant red spot, this one that is at the lower right part of the image, so the southern hemisphere. This, this is a giant storm that is basically as big as the Earth. Uh, and you know, on the left you have a modern picture taken in 2014, and on the right you have one of these very old pictures. And it turns out that the red spot actually was much bigger, you know, a hundred and over years ago. You can compare this also with the drawing of 1880, which you know revealed that the red spot was actually red because in the uh, in the previous picture it's not clear whether it was the red spot or just another spot. Let's talk about Comet. The first picture of a comet ever taken was Comet Donati in 1858 by this wedding and baby card, uh, which was a picture that actually was used for, I believe, a wedding or a baptism. Talking about comets, one very spectacular comet that we have lots of pictures of is the so-called Comet Ale Bop, which was the great comet of 1997. Some of you may remember it. Let's jump to nebulae, gas nebulae. One very bright nebula that we can see even with the naked eye is the central uh, nebula in the Orion constellation. And just to give you a sense of how long it took and how easily now you can take a picture of the Orion nebula, on the left you have a picture by Henry Draper, which was the son of John Draper, uh, taken with an 11-inch telescope in 50 minutes, almost an hour, in 1880. Whereas nowadays, with an iPhone, you can take a picture like this on a similar size telescope in just one second. Let's talk about galaxies. The first drawing ever of a galaxy was done by William Parsons in 1845. And it depicts the so-called Whirlpool Nebula, which we now know is an external galaxy uh, and one of those that we call spiral galaxies. So I have a question for you, Morgana. Where was this picture drawn? In Armagh, Paris, Burcastle or Greenwich? Burcastle. Burcastle. <laughs> well, you're right. It was drawn in Burcastle. And more precisely, he was drawn by William Parson, which indeed is the third Earl of Rosse of Burcastle. It was done with the Leviathan telescope, which is the big telescope that he built. And incidentally, uh, the Earl of Rosse was a very passionate engineer and also amateur astronomer. And the person that actually helped him most in his study of the sky was Thomas Robinson, which was the third observatory director in Armagh. So this is another big telescope. Now we jump into the 1920s, 1910s, which you can recognize also have this equatorial mount. And with this big telescope, now you can take a much better picture. This is a picture from the 1920s, and you can see a higher quality. And if you just uh, use uh, the best telescope in the world, which is now the Hubble Space Telescope, then you have this fantastic picture. And you can see the resemblance with the earliest drawing. What is that light? What is that light? Where? In the center? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a very active nucleus. This is where you have lots of light coming from a black hole that is eating up gas and then shooting out jets and, you know, a lot of energy. Now, the next slide shows you the discovery of Pluto with photography. On the left, you have an image of the sky as it was taken on the 23rd of January 1930, and then the same portion of the sky image in January the 29th. The stars are exactly in the same position, but there is one little piece of light, which is highlighted by the arrows, which actually has moved from left to right. And that actually turned out to be a new planet, planet Pluto, which later on has been demoted as a minor planet. Now let's talk about spectra, and this will be the last part of this talk, because photographic plates uh, and spectra were very important to understanding stars. When we look up in the sky, what we see is lots of stars. Some are bright, some are faint, some are red, some are blue, some are yellow, 
So they have different colors of different brightness. And yet we don't know if, you know, we are looking at a very bright star that is very far away or at the dim star that is actually very close when we see a given star. For this, it's very useful to use spectra. And in first instance, what we want to do is to try to understand the intrinsic brightness of the stars and their colors. Where are those? These are stars on the main sequence. So let me start. Once you can measure the distance to a bunch of stars, for instance, the closest to our solar system using this method of the parallax, um, which I'm going to link, leave a link for you to follow up, um, then you can deduce the intrinsic brightness of stars and you can plot them, you know, against their color. If you do so, you will find that the intrinsic brightness of the stars goes with the color of the stars along what we call the main sequence. Uh, so red stars are intrinsically quite faint and blue stars are very, very bright. Uh, and this sequence basically is where stars lie most of their lives. But there is a complication in this plot, which is then, you know, you also have giant stars, which are much brighter and can have the same exact colors of your main sequence star. So the picture is quite confusing. And an example of giant stars is Betelgeuse, which you can find in the constellation of Orion, and Regal, which is a bright giant uh, blue star, also in the constellation of Orion. To understand whether you're looking at uh, a giant star or at a fainter normal star, you need to take spectra. So these are spectra of different kinds of stars. At the top you have a very blue star, which you see that is brighter in the blue and violet color, and at the bottom you have a very red star, which is brighter on the red side. And you can see these dark bands here, and these are so-called absorption lines that highlight the presence of particular elements. Now, the key is that when you have a giant star, these lines are much narrower than when you have a normal so-called regular or dwarf stars. There the lines are a bit broader. So once you take a spectrum, you finally can tell whether you're looking at a faint red star or at a giant red star or the same for a, a blue star. And this is very important for all sorts of reasons because it helps us understanding how stars formed and evolved later on. My question to you, Morgana, is what kind of stars is the Sun? You can see that these kind of stars in this were classified to be O, B, A, F, G, K, M stars by a person that I will show you in a second. Um, but I want to ask you, was the star classified as a no star, a B giant star, a N star or a G star? A G star. A G star. Well, I mean, you really are lucky. <laughs> now, who classified the stars? Well, it turns out that um, the key person for this was a woman, and I will conclude by giving credit to Annie Jam Cannon for introducing the classification of the stars. She introduced this classification by looking systematically at a, a lot of lot of photographic plates for spectra of different stars, and she recognized that there was a, se se uh, a sequence that was uh, related not only to whether they were blue or red, but also of the kind of absorption lines that she could recognize on this plate. And on this, I will conclude my talk and leave you, and do not forget to ask questions in the Facebook chat. So, bye-bye from me, and bye-bye from you. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye.